words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are still in our Joseph series. We're halfway through now, uh, looking at the life of Joseph. And we've said that Joseph uh, reads almost like episodes in a, uh, in a series. And now we've come uh, to chapters uh, 40 and 41. Today we're going to talk about how Joseph uh, seeks the answer that God gives and what we, what you and I can learn about that as well. But previously on Joseph, uh, Joseph had been brought into a slave into the house of a powerful man in Egypt. Uh, he was uh, successful and rose to great responsibility in the house that he was in. And he, when given the opportunity, he refused to betray his master and to sin against God by sleeping with his master's wife, which is what she was trying to entice him to do. When he finally refused and the truth was in danger of getting out, uh, the master's wife lied about Joseph and said he tried to do, uh, to do something to her and he was thrown into prison. That's where we found Joseph last week. And here's where the story picks up in chapter 39. But the Lord was with Joseph. Remember, as we go through Joseph's lives, we're going to see that time and time again. But the Lord was with Joseph no matter what happened. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and the Lord made everything that he did successful. Throughout Joseph's life, this theme is clear. A God was with Joseph, and Joseph was with God. And now here they are in prison, or here he is in prison, where not, uh, well, actually we do know. By the time uh, we get to this part of the story where he meets the cupbearer the cup and the baker, he was about 28 years old. So he was 17 when he was taken into slavery. We're not sure how many number of years he was there in the master's house, but by the time we meet Joseph, uh, after he had been in the prison sometime, he's uh, 28 years old. And so the cup, bake, the cup bearer, I keep saying cup baker, if I say that, just ignore me. Uh, the cup bearer and the chief baker were there in the prison. Apparently they had done something uh, to the king, that, to the pharaoh that made I'm angry. I guess maybe the wine was bad and the bread wasn't baked well enough. I don't know. Uh, But they're there in prison. And one morning, uh, they woke up and they both had dreams. And they were dreams that they were troubled by. Uh, He says this to Joseph in verse 8. We had dreams, they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Isn't it funny that the one who had dreams as a 17-year-old kid that one day his family would greatly honor him, becomes the interpreter of other people's dreams. Almost like God tends to use um, some of the disappointments in our life to be blessings to others. That's, maybe we'll come back to that another time. Um, the character of these dreams that the baker and the chief cupbearer had, um, they were such that even though they didn't understand them, they knew that they were significant. And we know this because what troubled them felt bigger than them. So they looked beyond themselves for the answer. The thing that was troubling them felt so much bigger than them. They didn't have the resources themselves to deal with this thing that was troubling them. And so they looked beyond themselves for the answer, looking for someone to interpret what had happened. So Joseph called them to look to God. He said, don't interpretations belong to God? Let's look to him. Now, both of them, the number three figured in the dreams, um, different things happened. Um, uh, First, he interprets the cupbearer's dream, and he says that in three days' time, you're going to be pardoned and restored to your previous job, uh, and everything was going to go well. And he says to the cupbearer, just do me a favor. When you are out in three days' time, remember me, because I was imprisoned wrongly. Remember me. Use whatever influence you could have to get me out of here. Now, the baker thought, hey, that was such a great interpretation. I want some of that too, so why don't you tell me what mine is? Well, there was a, it was a similar uh, dream in some respects, but the baker's uh, dream meant that he would, in three days' time, he would be executed. 
And this happened just as Joseph said. So the cupbearer gets uh, lifted up to back to his former position and the baker is executed. But the cupbearer, when he gets to the Pharaoh's court again, he forgot about Joseph. He forgot about Joseph. And then two years later, it's kind of like a horrible thing in a story, right? Everything stayed exactly as it was. You think this is the moment. This, Joseph is getting out of here. This is going to be great. No, he's, it stayed that way two years more. For two years still, Joseph was in prison. Remember, he was taken into slavery when he was 17. And now we know from later on in the same passage that he was 30 years old. But God was still with Joseph, and Joseph was still with God. And so here's how the story picks up in chapter 41. Pharaoh, there he is. He's the king of all Egypt, the greatest nation of uh, of that world, of the world then, he has this, actually two dreams. He wakes up in the middle of the night, just in sweats, has this one dream, and it's so troubling that he just, he can't get it out of his head, and then he falls asleep, and he has another dream, not like the other one, uh, different characters, different situations, but it's, there's a lot of similarities, and he wakes up, and he's just troubled by this dream, and he calls all of the people in his, uh, in his life that could possibly understand them to help him interpret them. Why? Because what troubled him felt bigger than him, so he looked beyond himself for the answers. But none of his religious counselors and none of his wise advisors could tell him what these dreams meant. And there's the cupbearer pouring wine for the Pharaoh, and he says to the Pharaoh this, I can't believe this. My, I am ashamed because there is a guy who interpreted my dreams and the baker, and it turned out exactly as he said he would, um, and he's there in your prisons. And so um, uh, Pharaoh summons Joseph. So jo Joseph, here he is in just two years in the prison. I wonder if he's wondering, am I ever gonna get out of this? He's there in the prison, he's just doing his best, and then all of a sudden the Pharaoh's guard comes and says, the Pharaoh wants you in his court now. You can't come like this, so why don't you get washed up, maybe get a shave real quick, and then let's go to the king. And so um, he stands before Pharaoh. Now, this kid, 17, brought into, into slavery, in a master's house, doing well, lied about, in prison now, for, for whoever, however many uh, years he's been there, long enough to get a pretty scruffy beard that needs trimming anyway. There he is, and he's called before the highest king of the highest land. And Pharaoh says to him, I have heard that you can interpret dreams. And I've had one that I need you to interpret. Now, you would think if you were Joseph, maybe if I was Joseph, at that point, I'd be doing everything I could to try to prove myself. I got this, Pharaoh, don't worry. I know, listen, I have kind of a, this is kind of my thing. I have dreams, I interpret dreams. Don't you worry. I got this under control. That's not what Joseph says. He says, I can't. I can't interpret your dreams. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is God who will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Again, we just see clearly that God was with Joseph and Joseph was with God. At no point do we see Joseph departing from his trust and dependence on God. He staked his life right there in that room on the claim that God would answer Joseph, or that God would answer the Pharaoh. So, Pharaoh tells him his dreams. Um, there were seven cows. I'll, I'll kind of summarize the dreams for you. In the first dream, there were seven cows, and they were big, beautiful, healthy-looking cows, fat cows grazing in beautiful grass. Then all of a sudden, seven uh, sickly cows come, and they're devouring all the grass, and they devoured the other cows, and then nothing was left. And then he woke, woke up from this dream. And he falls back asleep and he has a dream about seven uh, heads of grain and they're healthy and they're strong and they're beautiful and everything's great. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere come these seven uh, unhealthy heads of grain and they devour the other seven and uh, destruction all around them. And he woke up from this dream. These were the two dreams. And he tells this to Pharaoh or to Joseph and Joseph says, King, uh, great Pharaoh, don't worry. God has revealed what he is about to do to you. And he, he says, the seven, the seven healthy cows and the seven big heads of grain, these are seven years of abundance. And uh, the, uh, the sickly cows and, the, and the, uh, the bad grain that devour the seven healthy things, 
that's seven years of famine. And he said, the famine's going to be so great that even the memory of the years of abundance will be washed away. So then Joseph, he, he didn't just interpret the dream, he takes a step further. So he says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, if it pleases you, look for a discerning and wise man to manage the abundance so as to prepare for the famine. And this is Pharaoh's response. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And he said to them, can we find anyone like this man, speaking of Joseph, a man who has God's spirit in him? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you are. And then he set Joseph over all the land of Egypt. I mean, talk about the perfect subject of a documentary, right? Foreigner sold into slavery, seemed to be on the rise up. Nope, uh, that, that was not the path up, went for even further down than he was before. And now he's standing before Pharaoh and becomes second only to Pharaoh, the most powerful king in the most powerful land. And just to make it clear, the king ordered, he took off his ring and put it on Joseph. That was the symbol of the authority of the king. He put took the ring on uh, Joseph's uh, finger. He covered him with robe. He gave him his own chariot. And this decree went out in all the land of Egypt, do whatever Joseph tells you to do. Beautiful story. Of course, it's not done. But there's something that I'd like to draw our attention to in both of these situations, in the prison and before Pharaoh. People found themselves troubled by something that was bigger than them. So they looked beyond themselves for the answer. They needed someone to see through to what they could not see. There was a sense there's more to this than what's on the surface, but they needed someone to see through so that they would know not only what's coming, but what to do when it comes. And it took a man, it took a person in whom the Spirit of God dwelt to speak the word of God uh, in order to turn the situation around. That word that he spoke was recognized as the wisdom of God comes straight for him. Pharaoh himself said, Egyptians had many, many gods. But Pharaoh himself says of Joseph, who is better for this than the one on whom, or in whom the spirit of God dwells? That word was recognized as the wisdom uh, of God. And the point for the takeaway for us today, I think, is that you and I need to avail ourselves to the wisdom of God, and not to the wisdom of everything and everyone around us. We need to let God speak into our lives so that we can find our way through it. Let me say it another way. I want you to be like Pharaoh so that one day you can be like Joseph. Now that might be a little um, sacrilege. Isn't Pharaoh the bad guy? Well, another Pharaoh becomes the bad guy for sure, but I want you to be like Pharaoh so that one day you can be like Joseph. Maybe you haven't had a dream that's troubled you like um, what troubles or what troubled these guys. I don't know, have you ever had dreams of seven sickly cows devouring seven healthy cows? You had that last night, didn't you? No, I haven't either. Uh, but maybe you have had a dream. Can, can I just say, this might be weird to say in our culture, I don't think this is actually that weird of a thing that people have dreams that are, are, are uh, are significant in some way. Maybe we in the West have, done, have relegated these kind of things too far to the side, but no matter what, each of us have found ourselves troubled by things that have felt so much bigger than us. And maybe even today you're in a situation or, or you see this kind of situation coming up possibly, or maybe one's right behind you. And you were in that situation and everything felt so much bigger than you and you couldn't find your, your way through it. You look to all the usual, usual voices for wisdom, for guidance, uh, for, for some kind of direction. Uh, but there isn't one thing that seems to satisfy any particular need that you feel. Nothing else is really working. And it's starting to feel like all those other voices have been making promises they can't keep. Their mouths have been writing checks they can't cash. And now here comes the preacher today. Here he is standing there throwing out another voice, the voice of this book, in with the crowd of other voices. Um, another way among many other ways. I, I stand here proclaiming, uh, speaking a way of loving loyalty to and trust in God. And, you know, it's funny, I'm, as I get around, as I have, we've lived here almost two years now, which is crazy to think about that it's already been almost two years. 
but I'm starting to get known, being known as the preacher. It's kind of, I like it actually. It's, I, I immediately get to good conversations with people. Some of them have some, uh, this hasn't happened too much, but it does happen in nice ways, or people are nice about it, but immediately there's some kind of like, I don't know, bad experience that they've had with the church, and they just kind of want to like, I don't know, let me know that they've had that experience, and I love it, because I love talking about that, because bad things happen everywhere, so let's talk about it. Uh, sometimes it's just to kind of like, oh, well, we need to watch how we talk around this guy, kind of thing. I uh, was at the gym this week, and introduce myself to somebody. He says, oh, you're the preacher. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm the preacher. A um, couple days later, I was in the, in the gym too, and I, I, did, I did pretty good in a workout, I just have to say. <laughs> Had a new personal best, so I was very proud of it. Um, and then one guy, as we're all cleaning up the weights and things, one guy says, yeah, that's not fair. God is on his side. <laughs> I said, and he can be on your side too, brother. <laughs> he just laughed. But I get into these, these conversations, and I love it. And I, I, I wish those conversations on you. I really, really do. I know you can't, we can't all be formal pastors, but man, I, I hope that one day you get to have those kind of conversations frequently, because they're just the best kind of conversations. But I know that when I speak from this position of faith, that I'm often speaking something that is immediately doubted. Not the sincerity of my belief, and they don't doubt that I'm doing a good job or whatever, but they doubt the truthfulness of what I say. They doubt that what is true for me is true for everybody, that God, that there is one God and he loves, he made all of creation and loves everyone and sent his son Jesus. Uh, they doubt that what I say is objectively true in a universal way. And we are so accustomed to doubting faith, especially in New England. We are so good at doubting faith. We're so skeptical of faith statements, of belief statements. You know, we want to say, put it in my hand and then I'll believe it. Or show me somehow the, the systematic proofs all the time and then, I'm, then you've got me, then I'm in. Uh, maybe. Um, we're so accustomed to doubting, our, doubting faith. I want to ask a question. What if we doubted our doubts instead? What if instead of doubting faith, we doubted doubt? Um, well, that can't actually be true. Well, what if it is? Uh, Jesus couldn't really have said what he said. They said he said, well, what if he did? Uh, people can't really have dreams that mean something or predict something other than the fact that they ate a bad meal and had indigestion while they were sleeping. Well, what if they do? What if we started doubting our doubts? We're so confident in our doubts. It's almost like doubting is its own belief system. That we just, that's our knee-jerk response. I don't believe it because, I don't know, you can't be proven or whatever our, what we say after that. So today, here I am, and I'm asking you to doubt your doubts. Consider for a moment what it might mean if this book here is true. If the story of Joseph is true, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of them, if it's actually true. Again, I want you to be like Pharaoh so that one day you can be like Joseph. What do I mean? Pharaoh was troubled by something that felt bigger than himself, so he looked beyond himself for the answer. And there was something about the character of Joseph's response that even though he could have said, well, I don't believe in your God, I have a bunch of my own, uh, he recognized that this was a wisdom, this wisdom coming from Joseph, beyond him. It was beyond even Joseph. In fact, he knew this wasn't coming from Joseph. He knew this was coming from the Spirit of God inside of Joseph a higher God, a greater God that, than what any of them ever knew. This was a word that came from God himself, and Pharaoh trusted that word. He didn't know the God of Joseph, but he trusted the word of God through Joseph. Not only that, Pharaoh, I want you to think about this, Pharaoh leveraged his entire kingdom toward the application of that trust. A dream that troubled him to such depths that when Joseph spoke out the word of God for Pharaoh, the Pharaoh says, I am all in on this. He staked his future on it, and he held nothing back. Pharaoh trusted the word that came from God. Okay, that's great, Chris. Thanks very much. Um, kind of like Thomas, though, we don't have Joseph here in our midst to tell us these things like Pharaoh did. If only we had Joseph, you know, Joseph who could come in and interpret dreams. Dreams. Can I just say, um, you do have Joseph. You have Joseph, 
You have Abraham, you have Isaac, uh, you, have, uh, you have Moses, you have Aaron, you have uh, David, you have uh, 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 Samuel, you have, well, let's just look at the table of contents here. Who all is in this book here? The people that you have. You have Samuel, you have Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and, and Job and, and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. These are real people going through real life events and just wrote them down. You have them. And then you flip a little bit more than three quarters through the Bible and you come to people like Paul and Peter and Jude. And let's not forget Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. You have all of these people and all of them from Abraham to uh, John speak of someone who is coming and who was come and is come who died and who raised and who is now living forever. You not only have all these people, you have Jesus, the son of God himself, who is called, Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians, the very wisdom of God. So no, you don't have Joseph. You have a whole heck of a lot more than Joseph. And uh, John Wesley uh, said it this way. I want, you to, I want to know one thing. Actually, I have it here. This is John Wesley when he was thinking about all of this. He says, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended. That's not a negative thing. It means God came down to teach us the way. For this end, he came from heaven. He hath written it down in a book. Wesley says, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. Pharaoh heard the words of wisdom and discernment from God and trusted them enough to stake everything upon them. So that's what I mean when I say, I want you to be like Pharaoh. I want you to be like Pharaoh so that one day you can be like Joseph. Real brief, this is what I mean by that. Pharaoh trusted the words enough to stake everything on them. Joseph trusted God himself enough to stake everything upon him. It's one thing to believe the word, to take the, the counsel of scripture when it gives advice on how to do something or how to, you know, Proverbs is filled with a bunch of wisdom statements on how you can uh, handle business, how you can uh, get along with uh, each other. Here, I just turned to Proverbs 12, verse 27, a lazy hunter doesn't roast his game, but to a diligent person, his wealth is precious. Well, think about that. I don't know what that means right now, but think about that. There's all this wisdom in the scripture, but Joseph, when, we, when we're like Joseph, we don't, even, we don't just trust the word, we trust the one who gave it. Joseph trusted God himself to stake everything upon him. It wasn't just in a word that he trusted, it was in the person of God himself. Joseph trusted God and he carried that trust with him from the deepest, darkest pit to the highest court of the highest kingdom in the world. Remember, Joseph was with God, but God and God was with Joseph. And this is the singular factor of Joseph's success. This singular factor of what brought about, that we'll start looking at next week, the physical real world salvation of an entire nation and the nations around it. That Joseph's trust in God saved lives. Joseph's trust in God blessed lives. So I want you to be like Pharaoh. I want you to just trust the word enough to stake your life on it. And I, I want you to trust, I want you to be like Pharaoh so that one day you can be like Joseph and trust the God from whom this word comes. That journey starts, it can start at any moment and it begins with a simple affirmation, God, I trust your word. I trust you. Let's pray. Lord, I do, I do trust you. I thank you, God, that for the freedom to doubt my doubts, that I don't have to believe my doubts, I can doubt my doubts. I thank you, Lord, that you have ensured that the account of your work in the earth has been passed down to us. So Lord, I, I pray for us that you would help us to be like Pharaoh, who trusted your word enough to move on it, so that one day we could be like Joseph and trust you enough to be that sign of blessing and that word of wisdom to those around us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.